Okay, today's video is going to look at air bursts versus ground bursts uh, and both the, the effects of these uh, types of nuclear explosions as well as their impact and your chances for survival. So the topics we'll look at, of course, is what are the key differences between air bursts and ground bursts, uh, what are will be targeted uh, by an air burst versus what's the target for ground bursts, and on the blast, thermal, and radiation effects of both air bursts and ground bursts. We'll look also at firestorms, EMP, and you know survival considerations and preparations. So first of all, we'll start with the differences. Um, an air burst, as, it were, as the name says, is exploding in the air. Uh, if it's defined as an air burst, is that the fireball does not touch the ground or other surface, the surface of the ocean, whatever. Ground burst is the fireball is going to touch the ground and quite often they'll be exploded directly on the ground. So the center of the fireball will be ground level. Half the fireball will scoop out the ground uh, and uh, the other half will be in the air. It can also be more subsurface. You can actually uh, have a penetrating nuke uh, which will penetrate to a certain depth before going off. You use those to go after deep underground installations. And so those are what they are. Now, uh, circling back to air bursts, if it's very high altitude, like 100 miles, 160 kilometers or higher, um, as a very alt high altitude burst, focus on that is on generating EMP. So we'll actually look at that little subject too. Okay, the air bursts themselves, uh, of course, are commonly used for counter value strikes against cities, refineries, and ports. Those are your targeting areas. Uh, whereas the ground bursts will be looking at uh, going for underground targets, hardened targets, uh, cratering airfields, and such things as that. And depending on the target, you can actually have a mix of multiple strikes on the same target. Air bursts to take out the overall, say, military base or other installation. Uh, or city and the ground burst to take any underground uh, bunkers that may be in that city uh, or military installation. So, okay, for example, uh, Washington DC would be targeted with multiple ground bursts and multiple air bursts because there's all these, the Pentagon would take the end up, and of course the White House would get ground bursts because of the underground bunkers there. And the city itself would take a, a couple of uh, air bursts to take out the whole city area and other the office buildings and anybody else out there. And the airport might get a, a well, like both airport, both Dulles and Reagan would probably get ground bursts in order to create their runways too. So there's an example of that. So how do you tell that one is uh, is the other? I mean, how do you know if you're getting an air burst or ground burst? Well, first of all, you can make a good a judgment based on the target in that direction. Oh, well, there's a... Uh, uh, naval base there. Okay, so it's probably going to be a ground burst to take out any underground installations within that naval base and an air burst to take out the port facility. So it'll be about two nukes there. Um, but you can also tell by the color of the mushroom cloud. Um, obviously, you want to wait until after the flash and both the last waves have passed before you're standing up to take a look at this. By both blast waves, of course, you have the blast wave that goes out the initial explosion and then that creates this vacuum in the middle with between the fireball and everything else and then of course the you now which sucks all the air back in so you get a, a, a wave coming back in so you have two you have to worry about so if it's an air burst um and the fireball didn't touch the ground it will be white be due to moisture condensation of course it'll also be white up there of course if it's what's touching water too Ground bursts, if it's over land, will usually be brown or black due to the earth and other debris being sucked up into the cloud through the stem. So that's how you can kind of tell. But, you know, always assume the worst. Always assume that, well, maybe, okay, I'm not seeing that, but maybe it's over water. So I'll expect fallout no matter what. Uh, it's always the safest place to be. So assume the worst. So. The uh, blast thermal and radiation effects of an air burst, um, it's usually detonated to maximize the radius of both the thermal pulse, you know, to, to set fire to things and burn people alive, and to maximize the blast wave, because okay, you can you have, you know, it'll have nothing to block it, so it'll just go out at some maximum distance, and you also have this weird reverb effect when the, the blast wave that goes down hits the ground and then goes out, so you can have almost like multiple blast waves, the blast wave coming out this way, one going straight down, hits the ground, and ricochets that way. Uh, so, uh, the shockwave does not transmit as well underground, so underground facilities will likely survive unless it's literally right underneath it and fairly shallow down. 
However, above ground facilities will be destroyed and people will be killed out to a lot farther distance out than they would be from a ground burst. The thermal pulse will also go out farther, setting more fires and creating severe burns to expose people. Now, as far as the initial neutron and gamma pulse, uh, while it's greater, uh, essentially the range of that is such that if you're out in the open and receive the lethal dose of radiation from the initial neutron and gamma pulse, you're already likely dead or dying from the blast or thermal injuries, or will be. Um, now, uh, smaller nukes like at uh, Hiroshima and Nagasaki, they had people who suffered radiation sickness from that initial pulse uh, due to the way the blast worked. Uh, it was a smaller weapon and, and the thermal flash worked. So there that is. So uh, fallout is a lot lighter, uh, though it's highly radioactive. It's just mostly from the weapon material itself. So there'd be more of the isotopes like, you know, I, radioactive iodine, cesium, and all the other ones that can you can end up that way. Um, um, and that is from the the fission part of the weapon, because essentially a nuclear weapon has three explosions for a thermonuclear. You have a high explosive that sets off the atomic bomb, the fission bomb, and the fission bomb, the heat, then creates the hydrogen fusion, which happens for the hydrogen bomb part of it, the fusion bomb. Now, the fission bomb is what creates the, the heavy gamma radiation emitting fallout. The uh, fusion part uh, of the weapon produces uh, very little gamma radiation. It's fallout from, it's more to do with beta radiation, which is nasty if it gets on your skin, you get beta burns and you don't want to breathe it, obviously. But if you have any sort of protection here, even indoor a simple house, you're okay because beta really doesn't penetrate much. Now, um, the thing is, is the, you know, the part from our air burst, the particles will be lighter. They'll drift over a wider area. There'll be less local fallout uh, as the winds blow it away. And by that time, of course, the decay will have reduced this radioactivity. But as I said before, always err on the side of caution. Assume more and stronger fallout than you might think. Because the fireball could have touched the ground due to, you know, bad uh, programming of the, of the nuclear weapon. Or even sucked up degree, debris uh, from the, actually the, the vacuum cleaner effect from the, you know, when the blast comes back in. And certainly if it's actually touched water or even near water, it can vaporize back. The heat from the fireball can vaporize a lot of water, even though it doesn't touch it itself directly, just from the thermal energy of it. And that steam will go up into the cloud, be irradiated and come down as radioactive rainfall or rainouts as they are called. And, uh, the suit from fires can also co-mingle with the light fallout and seed the clouds that cause the local lies of radioactive black rain that occurred at Hiroshima. Uh, so, you know, I again assume that you're not, just because it's an air burst, it means you're not home free from the fallout. So, given that, uh, you know, you also have to, uh, over a harbor, it's even worse, like where I am at here, there's likely would explode a nuke over Vancouver Harbor, or same thing if you're in Seattle, New York, San Francisco, San Diego, whatnot, and that will vaporize a lot of water and cause some serious radioactive rain. And one of the issues with that, of course, it'll soak into porous material like concrete and creates longer lasting radioactive hot spots. Uh, and certainly, so if you don't have any way of measuring the radiation, always assume the worst and get out of the area uh, as fast as possible if you suspect it is a hot spot. Now, at the very high altitude, we have uh, no blast thermal or neutron gamma radiation effect that will affect you on the ground. However, the EMP will fry out all electronics. It'll go up for hundreds, even thousands of miles or kilometers, and just label electronics, the power grid, and whatnot. And the goal being with that is to uh, use this as a precursor to a domain nuclear strike in order to disrupt a, the response to the incoming attack. Ground bursts, all the effects of the thermal and uh, shock wave is less because you're exploding on the ground and many more things that can block it. We saw that at, uh, you know, even if it's a low air burst, if it's, you know, it can be blocked a bit by the ground. That's why the casualties at Nagasaki weren't as high as Hiroshima because Nagasaki is hilly and there was a lot of dead areas that were sheltered from the, the effects of the blast versus Hiroshima, which was flat. 
uh, again, you still don't have to worry so much about the neutron and gamma pulse because you're that close and out in the open, you'll already be uh, badly injured from blast or thermal. Uh, the big risk is radioactive fallout. Uh, uh, the fallout is be very grit because you're vaporizing a bunch of the ground is being brought up, you know, you hundreds if not thousands of tons of it and it'll be radiated. And since it's heavy particles, several millimeters in diameter, eighth of an inch or even more, it'll fall quickly and, and locally create a very severe local fallout. And it can, you can end up with fallout coming down as early as 10 or 15 minutes. How it disperses, it depends on wind direction, speed, rainfall, uh, creating highly radiated rain out, other weather patterns, uh, and interestingly enough, you see these neat patterns in tools like Nuke Mac, and they look kind of like, like these cigar-shaped things. Ah, uh -uh, that's not going to be, that's so very rough, don't depend on that for your life. Uh, it's only a best guess. Uh, the weather, it can be all swirly patches here. You can even have like a, a, a patch with very little radiation here, but around it is heavy radiation farther down. All depends on so many effects in there. You really can't predict with any degree of accuracy what the you know, follow-up patterns are going to be. So again, assume the worst, especially if you're downwind. About 80% of your uh, radiation dosage will be received in the first day. Um, because that's when the, the 710 rule is the highest uh, in hour one. After seven hours, it'll only be one tenth of what it was in hour one. So it's absolutely critical you find proper shelter that first day and stay down there. And basically, we're talking underground, not just being indoors in your house, but underground. Um, ideally, the longer you stay, the better. Two weeks is optimum. By that time, the radiation will only be one thousandth of what it was. Uh, just look at my 710 rule of follow-up decay video for more instructions on that. Yeah, if you're out in the open or even inside a wood frame house, you will get a lethal dose and die a rather horrible death. So even if you need medical aid, don't even go wandering around the fallout. You'll just, you know, you know, finish off any chance you may have surviving it, your injuries because now you have, you know, lethal or near lethal radiation sickness on top of everything else you have. Besides, the hospitals are going to be totally swamped and people are going to be lying out in the, uh, you know, out in a parking lot with fallout falling on top of them waiting to get in. Uh, no, you don't want to go there. Uh, people died in the, in the parking lot and around the hospitals at Hiroshima because in Nagasaki, I guess 90% of the hospitals were destroyed. And a few surviving hospitals, a few surviving doctors were just swamped. Besides, they're going to pretty well run out of everything anyways. Uh, and think about that. In the United States as a whole, there's maybe 2,000 burn beds. So there's even a single weapon being de detonated in a single place will create more than 2,000 severely burned, third-degree burned, severe second-degree burned victims um, uh, than, you know, more than 2,000. So there's just no way uh, the medical system can cope with even a single nuclear weapon, much less uh, strike across the entire United States, Canada, uh, European Union, and England. Now... There's also a danger of firestorms. Uh, it's very lethal if it happens. Essentially what that means is you got all these individual fires, they form one giant big massive conflagration and it grows so large it creates its own weather system, sucking wind in as a gale force in rush of wind, uh, pulling in people, pulling in material, um, you know, and just and, and all the oxygen inside this fire is consumed. Now, ironically, these inrushing winds also prevent it from spreading. It's not going to spread like a forest fire to cover everything uh, because the winds are so strong, it hems the fire in, prevents firebrands and other glowing embers from floating out to start fires elsewhere. Um, and of course, it's not a given, though, uh, <laughs> because uh, there was a fire storm in Hiroshima, but not in Nagasaki due to the uneven terrain blocking the thermal energy pulse, and we'll get that in a second. However, if there is one and you're caught in the middle of it, your chances of surviving are extremely slim. I um, mean, World War II showed that uh, with firestorms could kill people in underground shelters you know, by roasting them alive or suffocating them from one, by consuming all the oxygen. Now, in order to get that firestorm, besides having good terrain, uh, you need eight pounds of combustible material per square foot, which is harder uh, to find in large cities nowadays with concrete and city centers with concrete and steel buildings. Out in the suburbs, it'll be a lot easier uh, because of wood frame structures. Now, you have to have half the structures catch fire within an area of at least one half square mile. Uh, 
uh, in order to create enough fire to for this to form. And your wind speed, ironically, has to be uh, less than eight miles per hour, which I think is about mm, 11 kilometers per hour, thereabouts. thereabouts. Um, otherwise, if there's too much wind, it's kind of blowing, you know, the flames kind of off in one way or whatever, and so they don't, don't get that central big stoking that's going on. So obviously it's not easy for a firestorm to form. In fact, the Soviets did a study on that and saying modern cities are less likely to suffer firestorms than the cities in World War II um, due to the lack of combustible material uh, and what material there is will be trapped under the rubble and less likely to ignite. And the terrain, as we've said, and the time of the year. Uh, for example, if, a far, uh, if in Seattle or, or Vancouver during the winter when it rains for a week on end or sometimes several weeks on end, you know, uh, everything will be so wet, you're unlikely to suffer a firestorm because not enough stuff will ignite. Whereas Phoenix, Arizona in August is far more likely to suffer one. So surviving. Well, it depends on you know, the yield, the burst type, distance, time, and the protection you have. Uh, obviously, if you're within the fireball or close to it, you're toast. That's it. You're not surviving that. You're going to get vaporized. Uh, if you're exposed to the thermal energy and are in a third degree burn zone uh, and you suffer burns over more than 20% of your body, you will die. Uh, second degree burns over 40% of your body. You can also die without medical care and you won't, like I said, there's not going to be enough burn beds anywhere. Blast wave can kill by blowing you against objects, blowing objects against you, or if the overpressure is high enough, rupturing your lungs and whatnot. Even one pound per square inch of overpressure uh, can shatter glass and injure and kill you that way too. So anything over 10 pounds per square inch overpressure, most unprotected people will be killed uh, by the effects of the blast. Because the zone varies, again, based on altitude and yield. Key surviving is to find cover as soon as you're aware of an impending nuclear attack. You know, cell warning if you're lucky, or if you're not, you know, your cars and cell phones and power uh, go dead. Uh, or you're seeing uh, incoming shooting stars, uh, that's incoming warheads re-entering, or even a flat initial flash, you know. You definitely want to get behind cover, between, get some cover between you and where that warhead looks like it's going to hit, or likely target area if you're having more of a cell phone warning. And um, worst case scenario, duck and cover is better than nothing. Uh, and remember, the blast wave goes out, then comes back in. Once the blast has passed, get underground in a deep sub-basement, underground parkade or subway if it's all possible, or the center of a building if it's not. And then by that I mean a building like a stone apartment building, concrete and steel apartment building, presuming the windows are intact. You know, um, do not stay or get into your car, as that provides almost no protection against radiation, and you will die. I know the instinct is to do that, but don't. Uh, if you're far enough away, uh, uh, and there's no viable protection for fallout, uh, then travel upwind if possible or crosswind from the blast until you find viable protection. If you start seeing dust coming out of the air or rain, uh, find protection now, even if it's just inside a culvert or under a bridge. Any protection is better than none. Proactively, uh, if you build it, you can afford it and have the space, build or buy a nuclear shelter. But if not, identify someplace near your home to shelter in, preferably underground. Um, uh, even if you have a shelter, and certainly if you don't have a shelter, be prepared to protect yourself where you, wherever you work, shop, or anywhere uh, away from your shelter by identifying expedient underground shelters such as uh, subways, parkades, large building sub-basements. Have a day pack with three days of basic food and water, first aid kit, transistor radio, flashlight. Bonus if you get a cheap uh, pen dosimeter to measure radiation, you can get them for like 60 bucks. Uh, pay attention to the news. See if there's a dangerous escalation, such as uh, uh, a use of a tactical nuke in Ukraine or NATO and Russian forces are shooting each other. If you do, get out of Dodge uh, right away. Leave town. Uh, but do plan ahead where you'll go and where you'll stay. Just don't just uh, go off helter-skelter, because who knows. In any case, for more information, you can watch my nuclear survival uh, video playlist, as well as read the effects of nuclear weapons and nuclear war survival skills handbook, and I'll give you links in the description. Uh, thank you. Uh, do subscribe, like, and comment below. Bye for now.